Anyway, Aleppo, a great trading city. Everybody who went to the souk will remember it. It is, and what, can we, why was it a great trading city? Why Aleppo? Because of its geography. It was on the edge of the Syrian desert, the Anatolian mountains, only 70 miles from the Mediterranean, only 60 miles from the Euphrates, all these trade routes homing in on Aleppo, the Silk Road, Isfahan, a lot of Indian trade in Aleppo, the Gulf, the Hejaz, and of course, Izmir and Istanbul. And geography made it a great trading city, and history also helped to make it a great trading city, particularly after 1516, Marge Darbic, uh, which is now an ISIL stronghold, was then the scene of a battle between the Mamelukes of Egypt and the Ottoman Sultan, Yavuz Selim. And it doesn't mean Selim the Terrible, I was told by Turkish friends, it means Selim the Resolute. Anyway, he got his victory, and of course he got it because he bribed the general on the opposite side in advance. And after 1516, it is part of the Ottoman Empire, a unique global empire. And I'd just like to tell you a story which comes from a travel book of the late 17th century. And it may be a, um, yes, here we are, here is Aleppo, very close to the Mediterranean and the Euphrates. Um, it may be just a story but it was, it's certainly been around for a long time. Suleiman the Magnificent is wintering in Aleppo. Aleppo was the only Arabic-speaking city to receive regular visits from an Ottoman Sultan. Why? Because it is a very good military base for their endless conflicts with Iran. Sunni Shia conflict already going strong in the 16th century. And there is a proposal to expel Jews from the province. And the Sultan asked his advisors to consider a flower pot that held a quantity of fine flowers of diverse colors and bid them consider whether each of them in their color did not set out the other the better. The more sorts of nations I have in my dominions under me, as Turks, Arabs, Grecians, etc., the greater authority they bring to my kingdoms and make them more famous, and that nothing may fall off from my greatness I think it convenient that all that have been together long hitherto may be kept and tolerated so for the future. And the council agreed unanimously. And this is the fundamental, or a fundamental aspect of the Ottoman Empire. It was Islamic, it was Turkish, but it was also an empire of diversity. And I mean, you can see it in practice, the way they use Janissaries from non-Turkish backgrounds, and many Ottoman texts praising the virtues of different races. And part of this diversity in Aleppo is uh, the French-Ottoman alliance, which is one reason why Syrians of the older generation speak better French than English. It is there from the 16th century. In 1548, who is spending winter in Aleppo with the Sultan? The French ambassador, because he's being used for advice on canon and technology. And there are consuls uh, thereafter in, uh, in Aleppo. How do I move the, better be here. Um, and this is Suleiman the Magnificent in all his glory. He, it's an authentic portrait by Lorix at the time. This is a, an early view of Aleppo, probably late 17th century, we don't know who did it. Another later view, I'm sorry it's a bit vague, but it's by Cassas, a French artist employed by the French ambassador, 1784. Hopefully there will be an exhibition of his views of the Ottoman Empire. It's now in the Museum of Tours. And here is the French ambassador, 1674, in fact, he's in front of Athens, then an Ottoman city. But there are, it's also a lost picture of him in front of Aleppo because he's touring the entire Ottoman Empire with 
with a copy of the capitulations, which were these agreements between the Ottoman Empire and foreign powers, not just European powers, but also Iran, on how their nationals could live and conduct business and travel in the Ottoman Empire. And he enters Aleppo in state, the French ambassador, and he goes to there are already many Christian churches in Aleppo, Maronite and Syriac and so on, and he went there and curiously enough, officially he is a ally of the Ottoman Empire. They're both enemies of Spain and Austria, but unofficially he's listening to Christian patriarchs and leaders who are secretly encouraging Louis XIV, his master, to invade the Ottoman Empire Forget about the Rhine, concentrate on Syria. Even then, that was the message. And very strong influence of France in Aleppo. There was a, a French consulate in the Khan al Gumruk, the largest Khan of all, near the entrance to the souk, with pictures of kings and one room furnished a la Turc to receive people from Aleppo, and another room furnished in the French style. And there are endless descriptions of consuls' entries into Aleppo surrounded by Ottoman officials and troops and music to show they had the protection of the Ottoman Empire. And already consuls are buying up the history and heritage of the Middle East, even at the height of the Ottoman Empire, sending Louis XIV Greek manuscripts, Arabic manuscripts, pistachios, gazelles, whatever. <laughs> And this is an extraordinary source on Aleppo. The Chevalier d'Arvieux, who is consul in Aleppo, consul for both France and the Netherlands. He also had a job at Versailles, and amazingly, he did travel between the two quite often. And he would keep Louis XIV and <coughs> Madame de Montespan in fits of laughter with his stories of Turkish marriage customs. And no doubt he kept his Aleppo friends in fits of laughter with stories of Versailles. And he's, the six-volume memoir, which I don't think has been translated in English, is an extraordinary source of how, from a consul's point of view, the city functioned in the 17th century. Presence the whole time kept the machinery well-oiled. Manners, ceremonies, dinner parties. 17th of April, 1681, he gives a dinner with service à la Tioc, which I think means meze, wines, liqueurs à la grecque, Jewish dancers, acrobats, and a European orchestra. And he visits Ottoman officials. He speaks every language under the sun, including Turkish, Arabic, Armenian, Greek, and Hebrew, according to himself. And, he's, and the Turkish officials also drink wine with him. And constant uh, uh, quarrels and disputes, of course, but his main problem was not quarrels with the Ottoman authorities, but between different groups of Catholic priests supported by the French crown, Jesuits versus Franciscans versus Capuchins versus Carmelites, and so on. And he said, however much Turks appear to be good friends to Christians, they never forget their interests and defend them very well and they needed decent and often repeated little presence in a steady flow, not just at the beginning. And the English consulate, Simon is going to tell us about uh, soon, a center of learning in the 17th century. Here is a famous book uh, describing a journey from Aleppo to Jerusalem by Henry Maundrell, the incredible book on Aleppo by Alexander Russell, the longest book in a foreign language on an Ottoman city ever written. It's just parts of it have just been reprinted. And the English, some English merchants helped rediscover Palmyra for the first time, 1678. This drawing is done later in the 17th century. So Aleppo is a center for discoveries and rediscoveries and exploration. Um, and Alexander Russell also talks about uh, this need for presence the whole time. And this is the only picture I could find of consuls in Aleppo. It's much later, about 1900. This is from the 
Poche collection assembled by the family of a Belgian consul in Aleppo. Incredible photographs and documents. Let's hope the collection has survived. And then these are obviously foreign consuls. I think he looks rather English. These are Kurdish chiefs, Ottoman officer, another foreign consul in the apartment in the Khan al Gumruk. And already uh, people are wondering about the future of Aleppo. What do the Kurds want? What is going to happen? And the role of consuls is so important. They're not just representatives of foreign governments, but also power brokers in the city itself, used as intermediaries between groups, and also, for example, encouraging <coughs> one event in Aleppo, which was extremely important, the, the rise of the Greek Catholics, a group of Orthodox Christians who accept the authority of the Pope after 1700 with the help of the French consul, and they become cultural leaders, and uh, later many of them are so hated by the Orthodox Christians of the area that they emigrate to Egypt and start businesses there in the 18th and 19th centuries. And here are some photographs of the souk, a khan about 1940. There were about 50 khans in Aleppo. Let's hope they have survived. Another khan. This is an English merchant of Aleppo, probably by Andrea Soldi, an Italian who was going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was used as a painter by local merchants and then moved to London. And he may have, um, he may have done this painting in London of an English merchant. I don't think he wore these clothes in Aleppo. I think he, because the, the clothes of an Ottoman official and yellow boots were reserved for senior Ottoman officials. But it's, you see the profile of the city on the left. They would buy grand costume in Aleppo, take it back to London, and then have themselves painted by smart painters in London. Here is another. This is in the Tate Gallery of an English merchant. And he's surrounded by the game he shot in the desert of Syria, because hunting in the desert was one of the principal activities of merchants of Aleppo. And another activity is another product of Aleppo. It's not just textiles and things you could buy in the souk, it's also horses. So we enter the whole world of horse history, extremely important. Why was Aleppo a center? Because quick and lean horses from the Arabian desert, which were much faster than European horses were easily available for sale there. And already, as with manuscripts and antiquities, Europeans could offer the best prices, better than the Ottoman Sultan himself, who in theory would have the best choice of horses. And this is a horse called the, the Harley Arabian, a brother of Robert Harley, the Lord Treasurer, and was a merchant in Aleppo. And he helped ship this to England. And some of these Aleppo stallions were literally worth their weight in gold. And they are, the, I believe, the ancestors of all the thoroughbred racing horses in Europe today. And Davia remarks that horse merchants knew it was so important, their pedigree, their bloodline, they knew the ancestry on father's and mother's side of their horses much better than most French nobles did. <laughs> Here's another horse portrait uh, by John Wooten. This is a Polish count called Rezewski who came to Aleppo in 1818 to buy horses, gave a lot of parties and left without paying his bill. <laughs> Aleppo is a great center, not only for uh, trading, but also for learning Arabic, really from the Middle Ages. And this is an illustration from his account of Aleppo. He observes the civil conflicts then 
occurring in Aleppo, not between communities, but inside the Muslim community, Sunni Muslim community of Aleppo between Janissaries and Ashraf. That's an extremely complicated, uh, possibly partly economic conflict, which was led to many revolts. He was here, a modern horse merchant, about 1940. There was still a horse market until recently. And uh, <coughs> one of the best documents of Aleppo were the houses and the decoration of the old 17th century merchants' houses. This is a panel from the Beit Wakil, which is now in the Museum of Islamic Art in Berlin. Um, and the decoration includes both Islamic and Christian elements, scenes, verses from the Quran and the Psalms, and pictures of St. George and Antar and Abla, the uh, hero and heroine of Arabic romance. And this is only one of many luxurious rooms made in Aleppo for these merchant houses in the 17th century. This was made for a Christian family, so it's a sign of how well Christians were doing under the Ottoman Empire. And many of these panel rooms have been sold in London and Paris in the last hundred years. This is the Beit Ghazali, another Christian house. Nobody know. I think the panels have been looted. This is the Beit Ashikbash. Uh, uh, Aleppo was a city of music. There was a famous Syrian singer, Sabah Fakri, who once sang for 13 hours, it is said, in a <coughs> concert in Caracas, because Aleppo people have been leaving the city for many, many years. So there are communities from Aleppo in South America, in North America, in London, in Paris, everywhere. It is a world city in many ways. This is from Alexander Russell's book. And another. This is a map of the city around 1910. Baidika. <coughs> Aleppo is very much on the uh, tourist map by then. Gertrude Bell goes there. Lawrence of Arabia is excavating outside it. And um, you see on the left the important buildings of first mosque, <coughs> second consulates. And of course, the most important building of all really is the Kazan, the barracks, because the Ottoman Empire, like all empires, in the end rested on force. Here is a photograph about 1900. On the right is the clock tower, one of many clock towers built throughout the Ottoman Empire to celebrate the reign of Abdul Hamid paid for locally in honor of the Sultan. And I think always they had four faces, two of which showed Western time beginning at midnight, and two of which showed traditional Middle Eastern time. It's not specifically Islamic, beginning at sunset. A house in a modern quarter of Aleppo, a room in a, again it's a Christian house, the house of the Marcopoli family, by then French and Western culture is spreading among the uh, wealthy elite of Aleppo. They were antique, antique stealers. And Aleppo was also a great Armenian as well as Arab and Turkish city. Uh, more and more Armenians came to live in Aleppo in the 20th century with the horrors going on in Anatolia to escape death or as refugees. And this is a modern Armenian hospital, the Altunian hospital in Aleppo. The best hospital in Aleppo, and it was used by Jamal Pasha, the Turkish commander, and by Mustafa Kemal in the late autumn of 1918 when Kemal is army commander at Aleppo and he even is involved in street fighting as the Ottoman army retreats at the end of the First World War. And here is the Australian army on the outskirts of Aleppo, November 1918. There is a brief 
British period, uh, at the end of the Ottoman Empire, before the French arrive. And here are some photographs of Aleppo as it then was. That is the citadel, the citadel again. This is Faisal, briefly leader of Aleppo, of Syria in 1918 to 20. He always had a message of tolerance, like the city itself, which was famous for the ease with which people lived together. He said, whoever tries to make differences between Muslims, Christians, and Jews is not a true Arab. But unfortunately, his rule ended, and he became king of Iraq. This is a parade in his honor in Aleppo. This is the arrival of the fr first French high commissioner in Aleppo in 1920, much hated. You see there's not many people watching him. One of the last of the camel caravans which used to feed the souk of Aleppo. This is about 1940, before railways and roads replace it. Here is a picture of a Greek Catholic family showing the importance of priests in the daily life of the flocks. Here is a Muslim lady of Aleppo already. It's quite modern. Uh, many or some Muslim ladies are beginning no longer to cover their hair, even before the Second World War. This is the grandmother of Zahid Tajuddin, the sculptor now living in London. And there's a second British period, 1941 to 46, when Allied forces have defeated the Vichy forces of the <coughs> French mandate. And um, there is a, a French administration, British political officers and army officers all over Syria who are encouraging uh, Syrian nationalists who eventually take power in Aleppo. And for some time, things go well. This is an evening at the Club d'Alep, which was famous for its parties and business deals that happened there. More evenings. And this is a Corpus Christi procession in Aleppo in 1961. It was quite common to have religious processions of any religion in uh, the streets of Aleppo at that time. And I don't want to talk about what's been happening recently. That's another subject. So I will end this brief sketch of the history of Aleppo, a very special city, a business city, where religious hatreds were relatively uh, subdued. And this is how it is now. And now we go to Dr. Simon Mills from Canterbury, who will talk about a particular period in the 17th century. A, a history of uh, Aleppo right through the Ottoman period. And what I'm going to say now really picks up on one small aspect of what he was talking about, which relates to uh, not the French, but the English uh, mercantile connection with Aleppo, but really relates more specifically to the implications which that uh, mercantile connection would have through the 17th and the 18th century for uh, certain areas of English, speak up, sorry, you can't hear me, sorry, for certain areas of uh, English uh, intellectual and uh, religious life. And so I'm going to begin not uh, in Aleppo itself, but in England, or rather uh, just off the south coast of England, where in the spring of 1624, uh, a young man in his early 20s called Charles Robson was setting out uh, on a ship bound for the southern Mediterranean. Can you, can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. And <clears throat> Robson was, uh, in, in many respects, quite an unusual character to be setting out on this journey. He was uh, still in his early 20s. Just a few years earlier, he'd been a student at the Queen's uh, College in Oxford. And he might very easily have followed uh, the same course as any number of his contemporaries and have left uh, the university to a fearless succession of uh, country vicarages. But instead, Robson set out uh, across the eastern Mediterranean, docking at the 
uh, Italian port of Livorno uh, through the Straits of Messina across the Aegean Sea. And he would have, the ship would have docked uh, three or four months later here at the Turkish port of uh, Iskenderun. Uh, and Philip tells me that uh, our patron here has uh, Iskenderun connections, so I won't say anything uh, disparaging about the place, but it, uh, the English merchants who arrived there in the 17th century didn't usually uh, think very much of it. One of them called it the hottest and most unwholesome part in the Straits, but that's where uh, Mondreau, uh, sorry, where um, Charles Robson would have uh, landed in 1624, and from there he completed his journey riding uh, three or, or four days on camel eastwards until he arrived here at his destination, Aleppo. Uh, there he would have taken residence uh, in or somewhere near uh, this building, the, the Khan uh, El Burgo. Well, I said that Robson was an unlikely character to undertake this journey, but in many ways uh, it wasn't quite so unusual by the uh, second decade of the 17th century. Mondrel, um, sorry, Robson had gone to Aleppo to serve uh, as a chaplain to the 20 or so English merchants who then lived and worked in the, in the Syrian city. The English Levant Company had been founded some 40 years earlier in the 1580s, but by this, the second decade of the 17th century, the English were beginning to emerge alongside uh, the Venetians and, and the French as one of the most important players in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean trade. Now, we might not have known very much about this character, Charles Robson, than that, but we do know a little bit more about him, and that's largely because of a letter which he sent back to one of his contacts uh, in England, which was published a few years later, 1628, uh, in London, as this document, The News from Aleppo. And there, uh, Robson gives us uh, a quite extraordinary first-hand account of the impression that 17th century Aleppo would have made on him, evoking, in many respects, the, the kind of uh, diversity that Phillips just talked about. So he says, for the inhabitants of it and the concourse of people it is an epitome of the whole world, there scarce being a nation of the old world, except that all hated Spaniard, who have not some trading either here or hither. That's, of course, a reference to the fact, as Philip mentioned, that uh, the Ottoman Empire was at war with Habsburg Spain at this point. And it was in particular the religious diversity which was most uh, appealing or which most struck Robson. So he continues, men of all countries, of all religions, Georgians, historians, uh, Copts, by which he means uh, Copts, Armenians, etc., the description of whose different customs in their conversation and tenets in their religion deserveth rather a volume than a letter, and a more appropriate observer of them than I can be. And what I want to suggest is that these words of Robson's were in some ways uh, very prescient because the figures who were to follow Charles Robson as chaplains uh, to, the, to the English merchants in Aleppo over the next two centuries would observe very closely the city that they found themselves in and the inhabitants of it, and their observations would fill many volumes, and this would have a profound influence on uh, various fields of English scholarship. And that's what I'm talk about for the rest of uh, what I want to say. Well, there are a few more traces of Robson's activities available to us, because uh, later in his life, after he returned to uh, England, he uh, left a number of manuscripts, both to his, the library of his old college, Queen's College in Oxford, and to the relatively recently founded uh, Bodleian Library, also in Oxford. So this uh, image that you see is a, a copy of the, the Gospels in Syriac, the language which had been preserved in the Bibles and in the liturgies of the Christians in Syria, which Robson, we can assume, I think, would have uh, picked up in Syria uh, and given to the Bodleian Library on his return. And this, I think, is very much the kind of thing that uh, a 17th century clergyman could have uh, picked up in Aleppo and brought back to England uh, as a souvenir. But it was really uh, Robson's successor as chaplain in Aleppo, a man called Edward Pocock, who would uh, make the most of the opportunities for collecting manuscripts which Aleppo would present. I'll just say here very briefly that the study of Near Eastern languages, Arabic, uh, Syriac, and of course uh, Hebrew, the language of Old Testament was really, at this point in the early 17th century, a relatively new uh, development in England. Uh, and, Rob, uh, uh, and Pocock was, I think, the first to recognize the immense potential which a stint as chaplain in Aleppo would provide him with to study these languages and to collect manuscripts uh, in these languages. So uh, in 1630, when Pocock arrived in Aleppo, he set himself diligently uh, to this task. He employed a number of uh, local tutors to help him uh, learning languages, 
And he made vast improvements, particularly in the field of Arabic. There's a couple of nice eyewitness accounts of uh, Pocock's study in Aleppo, one from the uh, English consul in the city, John Wainsford, who has this lovely phrase where he says that Pocock has made Arab his mistress. And there's another account that we uh, read, uh, written by a, a Dutch missionary in, uh, in Aleppo, who talks about um, Pocock as being like an oracle, extremely skilled in all the languages of the Orient. And it was also during these years that Pocock began to put together the extraordinary collection of manuscripts for which he would uh, become most uh, famous. The, missionary, the same missionary I've just mentioned described Pocock returning to England in 1636, laden with innumerable manuscripts, four large trunks stuffed full of the most elegant and ancient volumes on every branch of the sciences, on which he had reportedly spent more than 5,000 uh, piastres. Well, how, we might ask, did Pocock go about achieving this? And we can learn uh, something of the way that he collected manuscripts through a figure known in 17th century Aleppo as the dervish uh, or Ahmed. Those of you who are able to decipher the uh, Arabic script can probably make out his name in the bottom left corner of the picture here. And this is one of a number of letters from uh, this figure written to Edward Pocock, preserved today in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where uh, Ahmed discusses his attempt to procure uh, numerous books and manuscripts on Pocock's, uh, Pocock's behalf. And this really is a remarkable story of, um, of friendship and of scholarly collaboration between a Christian and a Muslim scholar, the kind of thing that was possible in the relatively uh, tolerant environment of 17th century Ottoman Aleppo. Ahmed uh, helped uh, Pocock in his attempts to learn Arabic. You may not be able to see on the top because the paper's a bit torn, but he addresses him in uh, this letter as uh, Talmidna al-Aziz, i.e. my dear student or my dear uh, pupil. Uh, the two of them clearly became good friends, uh, and we know from uh, other evidence that uh, in Aleppo uh, they managed to translate and to, to uh, copy uh, Arabic texts together. Here's a, another manuscript. This is uh, also now in the Bodleian Library. It's a commentary on the so-called uh, plagiarisms of the great Arabic poet uh, Amultan Abbey. And I show you this manuscript because it's one of a number of manuscripts now in the Bodleian which was actually copied uh, by this figure, Ahmed, for Pocock. And it's interesting because it tells us a bit more about Ahmed because he signs his name here as Ahmed uh, al Halabi Baladan, i.e. from the city of Aleppo, uh, Shafi uh, Madhaban, which tells us that he was uh, a member of the uh, Shafi uh, legal school. And then finally, uh, al Kushani Tariqatan. And this tells us uh, something interesting because it tells us that uh, Ahmed would have been associated with the Gulshani, a lodge of, or, or, or Teka, or Dervish lodge of Sufis, who in the 17th century uh, met in the heart of the old city, very close to the center where the English merchants would have, um, would have been. So it's a nice uh, insight into how possible it was for these chaplains like Pocock, certainly Aleppo, to really access deep into the, uh, the, the, the literary and religious culture of uh, 17th century Aleppo. So through uh, Ahmed, Pocock was able to procure some fine Arabic manuscripts, both for his own collection and for the Bodleian Library in Oxford. This is beautifully illustrated uh, copy of the book called Rasa uh, al-Ikhwan al-Safa, uh, the Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, which is a kind of medieval encyclopedia of uh, the sciences as they were then extant in uh, Arabic literary culture. This manuscript was bought in Aleppo for, by um, Ahmed for Pocock and eventually came into the collection of the Bodleian Library. Likewise, this is uh, Edward Pocock's copy of the uh, Tariq, or History, of the 16th century author Mustafa Ajanabi, uh, likewise bought by uh, Ahmed for Edward Pocock in Aleppo, uh, which eventually made its way back to Oxford into Pocock's private collection and eventually into the Bodleian Library. And this was a particularly important work because it would have, over the subsequent two centuries, profound influence on the way that European scholars and uh, European readers more generally understood uh, the history of the Arabic world, and in particular, the history of uh, the Prophet Muhammad and the early history of Islam. And many of these works which um, uh, Pocock uh, collected, as I say, came into his, uh, his library and eventually into the collection of the Bodleian Library. Pocock, during his time in Aleppo, was also able to collect manuscripts from among the Christian communities of uh, Aleppo and also from among the Jewish communities of Aleppo. Most importantly, 
uh, he was able to procure during the six years he spent in the city uh, an autograph copy of uh, one of Maimonides' works, perhaps the most important uh, Jewish thinker from the medieval period, uh, one of Maimonides' um, uh, works, uh, commentaries on the Mishnah, which had come to Aleppo at some, point, at some point in the 14th century and had been preserved by the Jewish community of Aleppo for some centuries before it was bought in Aleppo by Pocock uh, and taken back to Oxford. And many of these works which he procured during the six years he spent in Aleppo uh, were to influence the work that he was later to do in Oxford. Pocock returned to England to become the first Laudian professor of Arabic position uh, founded in the 17th century by William Lord which, uh, and, and a chair which is still occupied at Oxford to this day. And, and during his career, Pocock would produce works like this, a specimen of Arab history where he drew on the extensive manuscript collection that he'd been able to put together in um, Aleppo. This was also the great age of uh, English biblical scholarship epitomized by works like this, the uh, English Polyglot Bible, which was a really remarkable attempt to print all of the known uh, extant texts of the Bible in Latin, uh, Greek, and Hebrew, but also in the Near Eastern languages, Aramaic, Syriac, uh, Ethiopic, Arabic, and even Persian. And the important thing to stress is that works like this really only became possible in 17th century England, in part because of this strong connection which had been forged between England and Aleppo, and because of the presence of scholars such as Pocock in Aleppo, and the contacts they were able to make uh, with uh, Muslim and Christian and Jewish scholars during their time there. Well, in the years following the restoration of uh, King Charles II in 1660, the English trade in Aleppo went from strength to strength, and the English uh, merchants managed to capture the uh, largest share of the, of the silk trade from their historic rivals, the uh, Venetians and the French. And at some point uh, around, Dennis Phillips already mentioned the English, uh, or he's already mentioned the Khan, but uh, the English moved into this building, the uh, Khan al Jumru, uh, the Customs Khan. Uh, really one of the largest and most imposing Khans in the old city of Aleppo. This is a, the Khan is a, as it looked in when I visited uh, Aleppo 2010. And it looks pretty much, I think, as uh, it would have done uh, when the English merchants were in the 17th century, with the exception, of course, of these air conditioning things. And I don't think the mosque was there either, but um, this is the, the environment that they would have uh, lived and, and worked in. Of course, it's uh, painful to think about what kind of state it might be in today. But when I was there in 2010, it was extraordinary to talk with the, the the, the Syrian traders who were still using the building for the same purpose it was used in the 17th century for as a center of Aleppo's textile trade. And, and the, the few merchants I spoke with were, uh, were aware of the fact that uh, the building had been used by European uh, communities in the 17th uh, and the 18th century. Well, I want now to talk about a slightly different kind of scholarly inquiry, which was also closely linked with this English connection uh, in Aleppo and the English presence there. And that's the study of antiquities. Uh, in some ways, if you like, the, the, the beginnings of our modern uh, field of archaeology. Now, firstly, I should stress, oh, I, this is, I was just going to say this is a further manuscript, which this is an Arabic copy of the Psalms, which was connect, collected by uh, one of Pocock's uh, successors, William Halifax, in the 1690s. But to get back to the question of uh, antiquities, Philip's already uh, shown us this picture of uh, uh, Henry Lanoy Hunter by Andrea Soldi. And this, I think, really brings home the point that the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about here, these uh, expeditions to discover the antiquities of the Near East, were in, by no means uh, had the seriousness which we might associate with archaeology today. And they could very often blend with more recreational uh, activities. So Philip touched briefly on the, the legendary hunting expeditions that the English would uh, pursue, uh, sometimes for months at a time in the countryside around Aleppo. We also read of um, uh, huge feasts, even of games of cricket, that the uh, English merchants would, uh, would get involved in. And very often these kinds of uh, excursions could blend into trips or ex uh, expeditions to try to discover the antiquities of, um, of, of Aleppo and the surrounding Syrian countryside. And that's exemplified, I think, in this picture by the fact that we can see what may well be the ruin of a, a Byzantine church or some other uh, uh, Hellenistic building behind um, Henry Lanoy Hunter here. There's quite a funny story told by uh, a, a figure called Richard Chiswell, who was a merchant in Aleppo in the 1690s, where he describes uh, an attempt to uh, discover the site of uh, Seleucia Perea, which is a, a place on the mouth of the river Orontes near ancient Antioch, 
which was apparently the, the place where St. Paul set off on his missionary journeys. Uh, and, and Chiswell describes the, the, uh, the attempt of the English merchants to discover this place, but the whole thing quite quickly descends into a long uh, weekend of, uh, of hunting uh, and hawking with the local uh, Bedouin sheikh whom they encounter on the way. Uh, and there's rather a nice uh, passage at the end where uh, seven miles short of their destination and failing to see any of the remains, the ruins with their uh, prospective glass, um, uh, Chiswell notes that they, they abandoned their journey, for which I've just highlighted the passage here. We were sufficiently laughed at upon our return to Aleppo. But some of these expeditions were a little bit more serious, uh, and in particular, those undertaken by Robert Huntington, who was uh, in many ways the greatest uh, scholar to hold the post of the chaplaincy in the second half of the 18th century. And what we find frequently in Robert Huntington's letters is his accounts of excursions he's taken to um, Byzantine, uh, the ruins of Byzantine sites in the, in the villages uh, around Aleppo. And I show you this, um, uh, this uh, uh, letter particularly because here, uh, Huntington's gone to a village called Keftin to discover what he calls uh, the, the Gloria Patra, also known as the, the, the Lesser Doxology. His, his interest is really in the, the history of early Christianity. And so he's gone out to find uh, this uh, Greek inscription, which he eventually finds carved into a lintel above uh, a ruined bathhouse. And I show you this because it gives us quite an interesting and rare moment of interaction, which must have happened frequently, but really gets talked about between European antiquarians and the local population. So he says that uh, after discovering this thing, I told them the writing was, Alhamdulillah, I praise be to God. Uh, by such little stories, you will find you are not to expect great things hence of that nature. Well, Huntington did get slightly closer to doing great things when uh, he set out eastwards across the desert to find, uh, as Philip mentioned briefly, the fabled ruins of Palmyra. You can see Aleppo here, and if you look uh, down to the east, southeast here, you can see the ruins of Tadmor, which is not actually very helpful because I think it should be somewhere more up here, but this gives you some account of the, the journey that uh, Huntington would have taken across the uh, Syrian desert. Well, Huntington did reach the ruins of uh, Tadmor, Palmyra, but uh, when he got there, his expedition turned out not to be very successful. We know this only from the surviving notebooks of some of the merchants who accompanied him on the expedition, but from that account, we, it, it seems that uh, Huntington fell into some kind of trap set for him by the local Bedouin. Uh, was forced to part with all his money to redeem a number of his party who'd been taken captive and had to flee back to Aleppo uh, pretty quickly without even having so much uh, as a glance at any of the ruins. And this experience no doubt uh, discouraged the Englishman from making uh, further uh, trips to Palmyra. But nevertheless, in the 1690s, another chaplain, uh, uh, William Halifax, did undertake the expedition again. And there he was able to spend a uh, much longer time among the ruins, copying uh, pictures of the, um, the, 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 uh, the monuments, but also copying uh, the Greek and the Palmyrian inscriptions, the latter of which were then uh, of great interest to European scholars because the Palmyrian near Aramaic language was wholly unknown at this point in Western Europe. And here you see the results of this expedition, which Philip uh, again showed briefly, copies of the drawings taken in situ by a member of uh, Halifax's party later printed in England. And this was to trigger a great deal of interest in the ruins of Palmyra, and particularly in, in the uh, inscriptions that uh, English scholars found there, which was to culminate uh, over half a century later in the much more famous uh, expedition of Dawkins and Wood to, this, to the ruins undertaken uh, in the 1750s. And here are uh, Dawkins and Wood discovering Palmyra in the famous painting by the Scottish artist Gavin Hamilton, which for some reason they chose to do wearing these Roman togas and these rather fetching uh, pink and uh, yellow boots. Well, in the opening pages of uh, Dawkins and Wood's uh, hugely important book about Palmyra, they wrote that it's the natural and common fate of cities to have their memory longer preserved than their ruins. And there's a very sad irony here because the point they're making is that Palmyra uh, was the exception which proved this rule and given uh, uh, what's going on in Syria today, it's of course uh, very poignant to read these words. But it was another chaplain of Aleppo and the figure with whom I would like to finish, who would really do most to bring a knowledge of the antiquities of Syria to an English readership. And this was a man called Henry Mondra. Again, uh, Philip mentioned him very briefly. Now, unlike earlier figures such as Pocock and Huntington, Mondra doesn't appear to have had any natural 
uh, scholarly in inclinations. There's a series of letters sent out to him by his uncle, uh, influential naval judge, which uh, suggests that Mondra was pushed into the post by members of his family, partly to extricate him from some kind of romantic attachment which he clearly shouldn't have got involved in. And the letters uh, uh, do uh, tend to suggest that Mondra was not entirely happy at being extricated from this attachment. Uh, what we learn of him is that he was, seems to have been more interested in uh, his clerical career uh, and in money, uh, the second of which he was in continually short supply than he was in any grand feats of philological or uh, antiquarian inquiry. Nevertheless, at the prompting of his uncle, Mondrell did begin to collect and to send back inscriptions uh, and descriptions of the ancient sites around uh, Aleppo. This is a, a letter I turned up a few years ago in the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, which shows uh, a series of inscriptions, Greek inscriptions, copied by Mondrell from sites around the monastery of uh, Simeon Stylites, and also from uh, a Roman temple at the site known then uh, as now as uh, Jebel al Barakat. And, and you can see Mondrell's copies of these inscriptions, and you can also see in the left margin the way that these kinds of things were read by late 17th and early 18th century scholars was a topic of great interest. But it was really this book, Mondrell's account of his uh, journey from Aleppo uh, to Jerusalem, undertaken in the last years of the 17th century, that was his most enduring uh, contribution to the knowledge uh, in the English-speaking world of the antiquities of uh, Syria. Sadly, this was uh, to be a posthumous publication. Uh, Mondrell, as did a, a quarter of the chaplains who served in Aleppo before 1760, died in Aleppo and was buried there in the Protestant cemetery. His book, though, was a hugely valuable account of the overland route between Aleppo and Jerusalem. This, of course, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem was something that goes back in Europe right to the, um, the very early centuries, but Mondrell's account was slightly unusual because whereas generations of pilgrims had uh, entered the Holy Land at uh, Jaffa uh, by sea and then had gone overland to Jerusalem, the situation of Mondrell in Aleppo uh, made it much more practical for him to follow the route down the coast uh, through Syria and modern-day Lebanon to uh, Haifa, then to go inland to Jerusalem, and then to go back up to uh, Aleppo through visiting on the way Damascus, but also going through uh, Baalbek, and seeing the temples at Baalbek, and through the Lebanese mountains. And this meant that his book was not only a description <coughs> of Jerusalem, but was also packed full of the cities and the antiquities that he encountered uh, on the way, including, for example, uh, this uh, site which Mondrell found just, uh, but really by chance, just south of Tartus. This is uh, the Phoenician religious center of Amrit, which is now very difficult, uh, incidentally, to see because it's, it's on this, when I was in uh, Syria in 2010, it's now taken over by a, uh, a Syrian government military site. So this is quite a useful description for people who are unlikely to see the, the, uh, the site themselves. But there, Mondrell discovered uh, the Temple of Melkart, which he was able to correctly uh, recognize as a site of pagan worship. And he took careful measurements of these fourth century uh, hypogeum underneath the burial chambers. And, th and this kind of thing is really emblematic of the kind of interest that was developing in England and in uh, Europe more broadly at the end of the 17th century in Near Eastern antiquities. Likewise, at the church of Sidnea, uh, the convent just north of Damascus, Mondrell was able to turn aside from the convent itself and to notice this uh, Roman burial chamber with uh, Greek inscriptions. And I was able to find uh, some photographs of those in Syria of the inscriptions which Mondrell copied, from which you might be able to see that the ones, his reproductions were pretty good. Uh, again, this is a, a further journey that Mondrell took to the site of Cyrus, where he again copies inscriptions uh, in Greek and Latin, which are then printed in his account. And it was also Mondrell who was responsible for this beautiful woodcut with which I began depicting the city of Aleppo, uh, its spires and its uh, domed roofs laid out above, below the, uh, the great citadel. Well, uh, that's really all I ha have to say. And um, I just finished by saying that uh, the, the, the work that the chaplains did has not left any trace, I don't think, in Aleppo. There was uh, a, a Protestant cemetery where some of their graves could be seen a few years ago, but I have no idea what's happened to it now. But it's important to stress that the work they did has in many senses lived on. The manuscripts which uh, Pocock and Huntington collected and now sit in the Bodleian Library continue to inspire historians of uh, uh, the Muslim, Christian, and Jewish past. And the works published by figures like Mondrell, uh, even if they're no longer of interest to antiquarians, are now read 
actually by uh, historians of the Ottoman Empire seeking an insight into Ottoman Syria during the 17th century. So I'll just finish by saying that uh, the work of figures like uh, Pocock, Huntington, and Maudrell is worth remembering because it's a further testament to this remarkable city of Aleppo, uh, a place whose fortunes we all hope might see at some point a change for the better. Maya Shahadi, a student of conflict in London, and then we have Nicholas, a, a musician from Aleppo. Maya. Well, thank you for, um, for having us and for the insight into Aleppo's history. Yeah. Well, my main message as, a, as an, a person from Aleppo, would you like me to stand up maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so my main, my main message as a person who comes from Aleppo is uh, I was asked to say a couple of words about my city and in fact it's a very diverse and heterogeneous city as we saw during these presentations. Um, in fact it's a, his very, it's a historical city. Um, we claim that it's the, the, the the oldest inhabited city in the world um, that dates from um, eight millennia before Jesus Christ. And uh, different civilizations came into my city, such as the Romans, the Byz Byzantines, the Ottoman, the Mamluk, and um, now the Syrians, what they're called the Syrians. Um, Aleppo is an econo economic capital and I think it's something that is really important to uh, point out because it shows some of the tensions that generated the conflict uh, and nowadays conflict. And uh, although we talk about a certain um, sectarian heterogeneity in general by talking about uh, its uh, Sunni majority, Sunni inhabitants, 20% uh, of Kurds and 10% of Christians, it's very important to point out that the city is very divided in terms of class. And um, I think this is very important in terms of studying the realities before the war because it gives us an insight of what is actually happening right now and what are the, the nature of the, of the conflict. Um, in fact, I think Aleppo is one is a very interesting city in terms of conflict studies um, because while um, Latakia shows a certain sectarian nature of the Syrian conflict, um, Aleppo shows the contrary as the opposition areas are not necessarily inhabited by one ethnicity or sect. And pro-regime areas are not only inhabited by one sect or um, religion or ethnicity. And I think it's something very important as we can see through the, the intentional destruction of certain neighborhoods in Syria, which is called herbicide. Um, this destruction actually creates a certain homogeneity, but a class one and not a sectarian one. And I think it's very important to point out, and I think we have a moral responsibility if we want to do anything about Syria, in understanding how Syria and how Aleppo and, and cities like Aleppo ex existed and, and were before the conflict. In fact, these class divisions that existed before um, inform us of the nature, the very complex nature of the conf conflict and, and this is my message uh, as uh, an Aleppian. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> For those very wise words. And now Riyadh, who is a musician from Aleppo, will say a few words. Sure. Of course, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, my name is Riyadh Nicolas. I came from Aleppo, of course. Uh, hi, right? <laughs> I'm just going to say a few words about my background and also recommend a few organizations I have worked with uh, if you have any means to help by one way or another. So I came to London here in 2005 
uh, only to join the London International Piano Competition as one of the Syrian competitors. And I was very lucky to be a prize winner and to get the Educational Award Prize and then door open door and I was uh, been studying at the Purcells School of Music, the Royal Academy of Music and the Royal College of Music. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, working, giving concerts uh, regularly uh, at the UK and also teaching uh, at a special music school uh, because I'm an artist in, at the uh, Tillet Trust and also the Countess of Manchester Trust. Uh, now, I have been, of course, deeply concerned uh, you know, of all what's happening in Syria recently, but I really believe in the power of music to fashion some you know, kind of peace and uh, of course the, the, what I want to say that I was also very concerned about the image, uh, you know, uh, recently uh, happened in Syria and uh, I thought uh, the best way I could help while I can't go home is by giving concert and collaborating with uh, charities. Uh, just to give a message of hope that not everything has been destroyed in Syria. Uh, I'm going to just say a few of the examples uh, 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 and the, con the previous concerts I have done. The first organization I would highly uh, recommend is the International Rescue Committee. I have done a concert with them at the uh, Cadogan Hall with the London Chamber Orchestra and we managed to raise 150,000. Uh, they did a lot uh, of help, to, for, for humanitarian help to provide basic needs to uh, Syrians. The second organization I would uh, highly recommend is the UNHCR uh, for refugees. Uh, they, uh, uh, of course, mainly help refugees, and they are they have. Uh, uh, I mean, they are based not only in UK, also internationally in many cities. Uh, and uh, this was done uh, at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Uh, the third organization I highly recommend is the Arab. Uh, British society, who helps uh, mainly people, I mean Syrian peoples in uh, London. Uh, this was done by a concert at Leighton House in London. And uh, very recently, last week, I was very touched as well to get uh, to play for Syria Relief. Uh, they have uh, a program for orphans. Uh, and I was very touched by that. I collaborated with uh, an Armenian um, uh, artist, uh, Kevor Murad, and there was an auction uh, last week at uh, the Mayfair Hotel, and they also managed to raise over 7,000 uh, uh, pounds. Uh, and uh, last week I was also in uh, a tour in Switzerland to play uh, with the Syrian expat orchestra, who are uh, also, uh, you know, combined only by refugees, uh, and uh, the Interlaken classics uh, were also supporting the case. Uh, and at last, I would only uh, would like to mention uh, a person uh, who's called uh, uh, Mariella Shaker. She's also a young refugee uh, in the state. She was uh, chosen recently uh, as a champion of change by the White House uh, and a peace ambassador by uh, the Syriac uh, community. And uh, she has done uh, a lot of help uh, to Syrians. She has a campaign to visit uh, Syrian uh, camps at, in Turkey and Lebanon, and uh, probably get instruments to the children, and you know, convey, uh, you know, just convey the, uh, just help them to carry and learn an instrument instead of carrying a weapon at the end. Um, I think these are all my options. <laughs> which I have worked with. Of course, I'm going to collaborate with UNICEF as well, who helps children a lot. And if I would be very happy uh, also to, 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 to discuss any projects you, you know, anybody may come out with, or I'd be very grateful if you contact any of the organizations I have mentioned. Thank you very much. Cities die, but culture goes on. Now, perhaps there are some questions. Does anybody have any questions? I would like to ask Simon, how did Edward Pocock Peacock, Peacock pay for all those manuscripts? Was it his money or Levant Company money? Oh, well, it certainly wasn't uh, the money of the Levant Company. Some of the money, I think, uh, must have been his own. And, uh, but he also received uh, 
commissions from uh, figures in England, most importantly uh, uh, William Lord, who was uh, the Chancellor of the University of Oxford before he became uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So uh, he had money from influential people in England who were keen for him to collect these uh, manuscripts. Thank you very much. More questions? Yes, Caroline. I would like to know more about these class uh, yes. conflicts or class differences uh, because what you said was very intriguing because I'm totally ignorant about this. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting uh, more. Well, one of the. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to stand up again. <laughs> um, one of the most striking class examples that I would use in my analysis because I'm using it, I'm doing the study in my dissertation, is the destruction, the intentional destruction of informal and illegal um, neighborhoods, which are called La Chouaillette in Aleppo. And this destruction is mainly neighborhood of, of lower class people who actually came throughout the urbanization of, of Aleppo. What, so, something that is really important to know is that um, when the Syrian state was um, created and consolidated, there were different shifts and transformations, such as the, the massive urbanization of certain cities like Aleppo. And this created a lot of tension on the city itself, which contributed to the tensions that are nowadays very... Um, very existed in the conflict, and and in terms of class, um, the the class perspective on the conflict, the fact that um, certain neighborhoods and these neighborhoods are targeted, is part of a certain strategy of creating pro-regime and other non-regime areas, which, if we look at it from an evidence perspective, is difference between class actually I'll be happy to talk more about it because it's a very it's a and I'm still in doing research about it but uh, these illegal constructions I think are the most striking example okay can I just ask that sort of follows on sorry I just wanted do you think that means that part of the is it that the center of old Aleppo may be more protected but, uh, I mean, I've seen footage of recent footage on the news channel of the centre of the and, and life seemed to be going on as normal there. Um, so I just wondered if you knew, if you could say any more about that, whether whether, whether there is a difference in the war damage. What do you mean by protected? Well, by the I mean regime? That's because or by, yes, by the regime. Yes. Well, yes, of course, because. I mean, they are part of the responsibility of, um, it's part of human, humanitarian law anyways, yes. not to, destru to, to, to destroy any of these areas. So I do think that they can, could have been more um, protected, uh, but I think there's clearly a strategy, and they are following a strategy, whether it's destroying the old city or not, this is just uh, a, a consequence that they're willing to to, to have in their calcul calculus. Yes, Jesse? Yeah. It's, I wanted to ask you a question about the printing of the books. When these books on Aleppo were printed, mm. how many copies were printed? And then when the reading was done, the consumption, mm. were there like discussion nights like tonight? How was the knowledge shared? Who used this knowledge? Oh, very interesting question. Uh, I think, in a way, it depends on the, the kind of book. So I showed a couple of uh, examples in the presentation. The first one, the book by Edward Pocock, which was very much about uh, Arabic texts. And th this, I think, would have been uh, 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 originally printed in quite s small numbers. I couldn't really put uh, a figure on it. But, uh, but, but it then uh, eventually went through uh, other editions. But, the, but uh, the, the final book that I finished with, uh, Henry Maundrell's account of his journey from Aleppo was really quite extraordinary, and I think, in fact, became one of the most frequently republished books at the Oxford University Press. So it went through many, many editions uh, throughout the 18th century into the 19th century. It was translated into uh, Dutch, 
French and German, so it was read all over Europe. And, uh, and one of the reasons why it was so influential is because when, if you read any books about uh, Syria, right through even to the beginning of the 20th century, it's almost certain that uh, somewhere or later they will refer to Mondrell's account and he becomes almost a kind of standard author. So it was very, very influential in that respect. I'm not really sure if there would have been uh, uh, groups to discuss these things. I think it was probably more, some, more something that people would have read on their, in their own private uh, time. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, anything like a reading group. Yeah. More questions? Yes? Yeah. Thanks very much to all of you for your contributions. I was just intrigued by something that uh, Simon made, by the, re the reference to missionary work oh. by at least one Dutch missionary. Yeah. I wondered how much freedom they had in the in the Ottoman Empire or that part of the Ottoman Empire at that time. Oh yeah. And how much you know, lots of activities they could indulge in as missionaries and how much freedom of travel they had. For example, could that guy have gone to Antioch yeah. or other places in the neighborhood? Yeah. Well, I'll stand up because you're right back there. I think the question of missionaries is a very interesting one. And here maybe it's important to make a distinction between the English chaplains about whom I was talking and then uh, other Roman Catholic missionaries. And the English chaplains really had a quite a specific brief from the English Levant Company, which was to minister to English and uh, other Protestant merchants. And so they didn't really get involved in missionary activities. Although that actually began to change in the 18th century. And there's uh, an interesting aspect of the story, which I didn't talk about at all, where English uh, the English chaplains get involved in the printing of an Arabic Bible. But what they're doing there is really trying to promote uh, the uh, a knowledge of uh, the Bible among the Eastern Christians. They never try to convert uh, Muslims to uh, Islam. The much bigger missionary activities are really undertaken by Roman Catholics, by the, the, the numerous Catholic orders, the Carmelites, the Jesuits, the Capuchins, these people, who from the first years of the 17th century begin to uh, spread in, uh, in, in Syria and in Aleppo. And they're really in quite a precarious position because the official reason why they're there is to, from the perspective of the Ottoman state, is to serve as uh, ministers to the, to the uh, French and Italian merchants. But they also have their own agenda, which is to positize. But again, what they're really doing, and this is quite important, is that they're trying to convince uh, the Eastern Christian churches, the Syrian Christians, the, 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 uh, the, what are known then as the Nestorians, the Eastern Christians, to come back to Rome. And there are a few examples of where they try to convert uh, Muslims, but I, they don't do very much of this because this is the thing that would really get them in trouble with the Ottoman state. So I think that they have a certain degree of, uh, uh, they're, they're tolerated to a certain extent and they, they're, they're free to try to convert uh, Christian communities living in the Ottoman Empire. The thing they can't do is try to uh, convert Muslims. So that's really the answer. In terms of the travel, I think it's a very interesting fact because, uh, and Philip's probably found this as well, because what you tend to see is quite uh, conflicting accounts from different sources that you read. So some people, like Mondrell, who I mentioned, seem to be able to travel quite freely and to, to roam about to these various sites, antique sites. Uh, and other people talk about the difficulty of traveling. My feeling is that it's quite possible to travel uh, in the Ottoman Empire during this period. In fact, I mean, I guess this is one of the things that's quite striking, that we can't even really imagine what it would be like today to go on foot from Aleppo to Jerusalem, because you've been stuck by barbed wire and you know, military checkpoints every uh, few miles. But um, but, so it was possible to do that, but I think there was probably certain routes which people had to stick to and it was difficult to go off these routes. And there, were also, there was a whole system put in place by the administration where people would have to pay tolls of various kinds. So it was a very, very expensive business traveling. Mondrell mentions that uh, he, his, at one point that his uh, pilgrimage would have cost him something equivalent to the salary he would have earned in a year just to undertake uh, the journey. So it was, uh, it was, it was not an easy uh, business, but it was possible. Uh, More questions? Yes? Following the arrival of the documents purchased or perhaps purloined by Pocock and others in Oxford and elsewhere in, in England, did any scholars, young scholars perhaps of your age and condition, eager researchers, go out? to Aleppo or other parts of the Levant to seek to deepen their knowledge and understanding of Arabic and Turkish literature? Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, they did. I mean, uh, maybe I would just put in uh, a, a word of uh, defense for Pocock, because I think that when we uh, think about uh, European people collecting manuscripts in the Ottoman Empire, we, maybe immediately the image that comes to mind is 19th century figures like um, 
uh, Lord Curzon and uh, Kishindor, <coughs> these kind of people who uh, looted the, 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 uh, the, the manuscripts from the poor uh, monks running the monasteries. And I think it's, it's, my impression is that it's a rather different situation in the 17th century, and very much, as, uh, very much in the way that the English merchants who arrive in Aleppo arrive in a place where there's already a well-established commerce, which has nothing to do in its origins with Europeans. It's a, it's a commerce between, which stretches east as far as India. I think when European manuscript collectors arrive in Aleppo, they very much have to edge their way into this market. And there's, I've come across nice evidence where you find uh, Persian scholars in Aleppo buying up manuscripts, and Europeans really have to compete with this thing. So they're really dependent on people like uh, Ahmed al Ghoshani, the character I mentioned, to buy manuscripts for them. And I don't think, that even if they wanted to purloin things, it would be a bit difficult for them uh, to do so. In answer to the second bit of the question, uh, it's certainly true that uh, young scholars are inspired by what um, Edward Pocock does in the 1630s. And the second figure I talked a little bit about, Robert Huntington, was a student of uh, Edward Pocock and was inspired by his example to go to Aleppo. And you find many other examples of, uh, of people, some of whom take up these positions as chaplains or other uh, administrative positions with the Levant trade, and so they have an opportunity to go that way. But there are a number of figures. Uh, there's a, an intriguing figure called uh, uh, Christian Ravius is a, a German scholar who just kind of set off on their own accord to uh, the Ottoman Empire and try to uh, spend their time there learning languages and making collections of, uh, of manuscripts. But it's maybe it's maybe a much rarer thing than we would find, say, in the 19th century. But there are but there are people that, uh, that try to do this. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for all, all of that, and we can continue the discussion. And some of us are staying on for dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you.